My, my name is Eric. I'm uh, one of the founders of a, a company called Generable, where we do uh, work in early and mid-stage clinical research, uh, basically preclinical uh, phase one and two clinical trials. Um, this talk is going to be about some use cases in, in productizing STAN. I don't even know if it's a word, productize something. Um, we're also going to have, so, so I'll, I'll go for a little bit, uh, maybe 30 minutes, then Marcus is going to do uh, a bit, and then Anna uh, from Lendable, and then we'll, if we have some time, we'll have like a panel, uh, panel discussion as well. Uh, so that's the plan. All right, so productizing stand, it's kind of a, a dry subject, so we'll spice it up a notch, uh, as they say in the US. Uh, does anybody work in finance? Anybody work in finance? You guys know uh, what this is? Have you seen this formula? It's like uh, uh, one of the most elegant models that came out of quantitative finance in, in um, 70s. Um, this guy is Bud Fox from the movie Wall Street. Yes, sir. Sorry, I'm interrupting. No worries. Can you just drop five to ten minutes before six, twenty, twenty-five minutes, and then right after there's no pressure. Okay. So that the people can move. Yeah. Sorry. No, no problem. Okay. So, uh, the, the question we want to ask is like, why, why do we want to productize anything? And, and so this is kind of my lead up to, uh, to trying to answer this question. Um, and so the, um, in, in about 1970s, there's a paper that came out that, that described this model for pricing call options. Um, and shortly after, uh, Chicago Board of Options Exchange uh, started trading these products. Uh, now the traders that kind of look like this, uh, they don't really understand nor do they particularly care about partial differential equations that give rise to this kind of model. But yet they do use them, uh, the model that is, uh, in their daily work. Uh, and to use them successfully, they've, they have to observe how this model works under different conditions. Um, and by this time, at this point, like this model uh, has been fully socialized, meaning that people have used it enough uh, so that uh, they kind of understand what, what it does. Um, and they know when it works well and when it doesn't work well. And this is kind of uh, the, my, my pitch to people who develop models is like, we gotta put them in front of users uh, so that these models can get better over time. So we can actually test them in, 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 their, in their real conditions. There's lots of benefit to doing that. Um, in our field where we, we work in clinical research, sometimes uh, you know, people make decisions on whether or not to, let's say, switch somebody in to a different uh, trial arm, right? So you have like an oncology trial and they measure, let's say, uh, tumor sizes over time. And the common thing there is to say, well, if the tumor is reduced by 30%, you know, we sort of declare that, that uh, this, this treatment is working, or if it's increased by 30%, they uh, declare progression of the disease. Uh, that's a raw data decision, right? Which is nice on one hand, you just observe the data. On the other hand, that's kind of a problem, right? Because there's lots of measurement noise in it, you just use that, you're going to be whipsawed. So you, your decision will be sort of whipsawed around. Uh, so you want to say, well, instead of that, we'll say, what is the probability that the tumor size will be increased or decreased by 30%? That's better, but then now you're asking your user to uh, accept your model, right? And why should they? Why should they believe you? that this is a good model, in fact. So you're, on one hand, we think the model is great, but, the, but you have to, some convincing to do. Um, and so it's always on us, I feel like, the people who develop models, to do that, um, to do that convincing. And the only way I know of um, 
of, of doing it well is to expose the model in front of those users and let them use it a lot, right? So, you know, unlike people in finance, we tend to work with the models like these, which if, if you went to Daniel's talk earlier, he was talking about uh, order differential equations. And so we, you know, this is a, a common model that we see in, in pharmacometric research where we observe some concentration uh, of compounded blood. And there's a model for how it transfers between compartments. Uh, and there's some, some um, statistical distribution around it. And that's like really cool uh, that we can do that in Stan. Uh, so, okay, so the, the, the rest of, uh, of this, uh, uh, hopefully I, 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 I set this up um, and, and gave enough reasons to why, why should we actually do this. Um, so the rest of the talk, uh, I'll touch a bit on the Bayesian workflow, which you might have seen already if you, uh, if you came to Jonah's talk, you probably talked about it. Um, talk about more of the, like a practical goals of productization, the, uh, uh, tactical goals. Uh, and then we'll describe like an infrastructure that we use at General uh, to do it. Uh, and then we'll have a couple other talks uh, and and uh, we'll see if we get to the panel. Hopefully we will. Right. So this is a typical picture that, that I show for the Bayesian workflow uh, in a sense that the, the, the interesting part is this formulating of generative model. Uh, and that, that often takes a long time, right? Uh, particularly if we're working with complex models like OD models, they take a long time to fit. Um, and so it's a little frustrating, right? I have a model may be running for like two days. At the end, I find out it's not so great. Well, I just lost two days. Uh, that's, that's annoying, right? So we try to solve this part by having an infrastructure we can, where we can fit lots of those things simultaneously on a cluster somewhere um, and hopefully speed up the process. Um, you know, also, I, I think in, in Dan's talk, if you saw, there's a, now a nice interface that Sebastian Weber from Novartis, uh, mostly developed to uh, allow us to do uh, uh, multiprocessor interface MPI. Uh, so a lot of this stuff uh, right, uh, is, is, is uh, just getting to the right model, to simulating lots of data, recovering uh, parameters, and so on. And then, you know, we, uh, of course, we do lots of model fitting. Um, here we try to, uh, we sample from the posterior predictive distribution, right? And, and uh, we try to save that uh, distribution so we know, uh, we know what happens to it, to uh, uh, and which, which data belongs to which posterior um, and which model. And then there's uh, also typically a decision problem. So this is often uh, an overlooked part of the workflow uh, because in statistics, you know, people uh, oftentimes just end with the inference, right? Um, we've got some parameter estimated, maybe we made some predictions. But in the kind of work that we do, uh, there's, there's a decision that needs to be made. Um, and that decision involves some kind of trade-offs. Uh, maybe there's a trade-off between an efficacy and toxicity of treatment. Um, and so we need to evaluate those. Uh, decision in a principal way. And this is where the uh, uh, Bayesian decision analysis comes in, comes uh, in very handy. Um, so there, there, are, there are a number of um, uh, goals that you may have for doing productization. I'll, I'll point out the ones that we care about. So uh, some people try to automate model construction. Um, so actually creating models like packages like R, Stan, Arm, and VRMS do some of that. There are some people who think about like developing graphical interfaces for model constructions. We don't do that, so we, we don't focus on it. We just stick to Stan. Uh, we do uh, enable model fitting uh, in a pretty fast uh, way. Um, also maintaining posterior database. That's something that if you're fitting lots of models, it's become a, it's an administrative issue. You have now you know, 20 different distributions from different runs like which one is the one I need, you know, in, in regulated environments that becomes a big, big deal. And then, you know, actually deploying, um, deploying these things into production, 
Uh, and there you can imagine two modes of operation. You, can, you might deploy it for interactive use. That's largely our use case. Or you can be deploying it for automated decision making. So people who work in sort of higher frequency domains in finance or in ad, on advertising or so on will oftentimes do this kind of thing. We, we tend to focus on the interactive use. Right. Um, so uh, in order for us to do our job uh, better um, and um, expose some of these posterior distributions for, to decision makers, we're de uh, developing this uh, analytics stack uh, on top of uh, AWS. That has two, two main components. Uh, the one I'll talk about mostly is this uh, Elastic Compute Service. Uh, and it really um, set up to accomplish these four major goals. Uh, one is the, I alluded to earlier, which is the provenance of the posterior distribution, right? Which, uh, which model and data uh, give rise to a specific posterior? Uh, scalability is another one, sharing collaboration and, and reproducibility. Um, in order to make this thing tractable, we, uh, sort of on, a, on, the, on the cloud, we build out this, this analytics context. So we have a concept of a user uh, that has some uh, permissions. Uh, and then there are uh, programs um, and data sets that live within an analytics project. So you start, you set up a project. Um, each one of these guys, so one instance of a program, one specific instance of a data set, uh, results in a run. Uh, and a run then results in a number of chains uh, that come out, uh, which is actually your, your output. And so a unique run was determined by the data um, program and the run arguments, right? So those would be like maybe some initial conditions or other meta parameters. Um, in terms of the access patterns, uh, we developed uh, a pretty simple management console, uh, like a web uh, UI that tells us what's going on. Uh, also, it's, a, it's an AWS um, infrastructure, so you can look at it from AWS console. Uh, there's a REST API that's like a thin layer over the, over the infrastructure that can be consumed pretty much by any language. Uh, we have developed an R, uh, R package, which I'll show. Uh, but you can easily do that um, uh, with other packages as well, or other la languages. So to give you a, an example, without like running anything live, because that's scary, um, we load up the uh, R library, uh, because there's a, remember, a user contact, so I, I, I connect with a username, uh, when I type this in, it'll prompt me for a password. Uh, and once authenticated, I, I'm now in, in my context, and then I, I can do like, show me all the projects that I've been working on. And so this goes out in the AWS and, and pulls out the names, descriptions of all the different projects. Right? Uh, each object gets a, a unique hash. Then we could uh, access each individual run. So if the run already completed, uh, give it a name, we open this project. Uh, we have this function get run, and then you could take a look and see what what has been run. So this was uh, this uh, uh, project page poster. It's the poster we did for page conference. Had four chains. Um, here's the number of iterations, and it says that all four are completed. Pretty easy. Um, similarly, you know you can get the actual listing of the program, right? So. Um, you get a program ID, call it, and then uh, we could actually cat the program so we can see exactly which, which stamp program was used to make a run. And you can have like these help us summary functions, like similar to what you see if you use like an R standard or something like that, where you can get like summary of run, run statistics and, and so on. And of course, you, there, there are extract functions that let you access each, in, each individual parameter. So here I'm extracting this parameter theta12, take a look at it. Uh, and then you can use all of the tools that you've been, you're familiar with in, in R or wherever you're working 
uh, you know, to display. Let's here we just draw uh, a, a histogram uh, of this CL parameter using base plot. Good so far. And of course, uh, the if you haven't have had any projects, we can go and uh, create a program. So you can load one from. Uh, from a stand file, you can create that stand file anywhere you'd like. Um, get the read the data in, and then uh, create the data set. This puts the data set out, out on AWS, and then you uh, call this function called create run. So the, the cool thing is, these are all non-blocking uh, calls, right? So unlike, let's say, if you're in R stand or something else where you 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 call sampling or or some other function, that it just like you know, executes and blocks you. This thing it returns immediately, um, and it does its thing. Um, what kind of thing it does? It'll uh, go out there. It'll spin up as many compute nodes as necessary to satisfy the task. It's not going to bother you. You can get a, a, a status of, of these runs uh, by uh, doing like this uh, get run, or by going to um, an interface like this. Uh, so, you know, we could go to a, a, um, uh, our API interface, so you can see all the projects that uh, are available. You click on current, it'll show you things that are currently sampling or in process. It'll give you a quick summary of, of, of what's going on. Also, uh, you can use the uh, the REST framework, sort of a raw REST framework, these are the API, RESTful APIs uh, on uh, AWS to look at the objects. And th these are, in th fact, the ones that are being consumed by, by the package um, that have that, uh, been developed. That's another way to look at it. And of course, like the, the, the cool thing uh, is that once that is done and, and this posterior distribution is created, we can then deploy it and then we could uh, run and develop applications on top of it for use uh, for people who are you know, not, not, um, not specialists. So this is just a, as an example of, a, of one, such, uh, one such simple application. This happens to be um, a uh, clinical trial for non-small cell uh, lung cancer uh, had two two arms. There was a there was a standard chemotherapy uh, arm and a targeted uh, targeted therapy arm. Uh, the measurements for for those of you uh, who are not familiar with with uh, with solid uh, cancers, the the way they do measurements is this is a this is a scan. It's a lung scan. Um, what they do is the patient comes up to a clinic um, and they measure uh, a number of baseline tumors that they identify. The way they measure it is they take uh, a longest diameter. So you see it's kind of this tumor is irregular. Take the longest diameter. Uh, they identify, let's say, five tumors that they're going to track. They sum it. Uh, and that becomes your measurement. So they, when it says SLD, uh, this is a sum of longest diameter of baseline tumors um, in millimeters. This is the part that I sort of, when I started this talk, I alluded to uh, earlier in saying, well, you know, this measurement is noisy. You can see how that is, right? Like, first of all, these are irre highly irregular. Um, I, I, they're also obviously uh, um, not invariant to the axes of, of the imagery, right? So you take, a, take it from a slightly different angle, you, you get a different result, right? Which is why we, we kind of need a model. And so this, in this uh, sort of application, this is a, a model that, uh, that tracks a survival probabilities for each individual, and they have a submodel for each tumor. So this is a, what's in survival literature called joint model um, of tumor dynamics. So uh, here, we actually making a prediction for tumor progression for each individual patient, and that has some influence on their individual survival curves. Um, and um, so you can sort of like play with this kind of application, interact with it, do make, make predictions, and, and so on. 
Um, and that's all I have uh, for you. Uh, you got any questions for, for us or me, feel free to ping us on uh, Twitter. Dan and I are both pretty big into Twitter. We just saw, also just launched this new uh, Twitter account called BizDose. It's like a daily snippet of some busy and uh, goodness. Uh, so check it out. Um, and that's all I have. Hello, I'm Markus Ojala so from Smartville, Dio. So today I will talk to you about like one of the use cases that we have been running with Stan. So in production, so based on the revenue estimation. This is actually quite old project already, so we have been running this for one and a half years. So it runs actually a day for about 1,000 customers. There is old blog post, if you are interested in more details, what we have been running, how we actually, what is the code and everything detailed. So, and I'm very famous to be like referred by Andrew Gelman also for this blog post, and there are those jokes about that. So. So I will go through the use case, so you get context of what we are doing, and then also like what are our learnings in productizing and stand to get it working. So to first understand what we are doing, so you, you understand the use case and how we solve it. So what is Smartly? So we are Facebook and Instagram, Instagram marketing partners. So we help the world's largest advertisers to basically make their online advertisement and then optimize all the results. So through us goes about 1 billion yearly already. So that's a huge percentage of Facebook spent already. So it's like money going through Stan. So I'm not sure it might be one of the biggest like money-wise use cases for Stan at the moment, but I don't have the details. So I joined three years ago, we were 20, now we are 250 globally, growing fast still. So about the use case, what we are solving. So budget allocation. So if you are doing online advertisement, you have a lot of campaigns. So you, of course you're targeting maybe different countries, you have different promotions. You, uh, there are like four main parameters when you are doing advertisement. So it's like budget, how much money you are putting to some ad. Then you have the audience who are you are targeting. Then the creative, what you are showing to them. And then also bid, bid amount, how much you are willing to pay for showing that. So that budget, budget and bit, they are basically comparable, so they affect the delivery. Oh. So then the main question is, of course, that, hey, I would like to put my money on the ad that brings most of the my best results to the customers. So you have a lot of campaigns running and you would like to allocate the money to the best creative or ad. So we have implemented this kind of predictive budget allocation. So this is the tool how it's shown to the user what we have. So one and a half years ago, we only allowed optimizing towards conversion. So conversion can be, for example, purchase on web page. So how uh, advertisement works, you see an ad on your Facebook news. So that's an impression you click that you end up on the web page. Maybe you uh, view some products, then you add something in the cart, you do a purchase. Purchase is a conversion. And then that purchase brings you revenue, maybe it brings you profit. So that's like quite long conversion funnel. So what we ask from the user is that like what you want to optimize towards. So for example, the conversions towards the pixel and purchase. And then we just like try to maximize the purchase amount that you get from those conversions. So before uh, one, one year ago, we had only that conversion. Now we have revenue optimization. So that revenue part, so if you click that on the UI, so that's what's done in the back end, then every month. So then what is happening? So let's go. So of course that one part is using stand, so but what are we in overall doing? So we do multi arm bandits. So basically that's that's the like nice name, it's scale my reason to say that it should be just called explorer and exploitation problem. Because he didn't like the multi arm bandit. So it's basically the idea is that you have few campaigns, maybe ten campaigns, you don't know anything in the beginning. They refer to those like gaming slots where you don't know anything, so arms. How do you do it? So you just start to put spend on some, some of the uh, campaigns, and then you start to observe. You get impressions, you get clicks, you get conversions. The more you learn, the better you know. So, and then there is this kind of uh, basic theory: how you should, uh, what is the optimal strategy in this kind of games? 
So we use this Bayesian bandwidth Thompson sampling. So the number of pools for a given level should match its actual probability of being the optimal level. So basically that corresponds to our case so that proportion of budget for a campaign should match which is probability of being the best campaign. There are a lot of complexities that come with this. So when you change the budget, when you change things, so that affects the performance, you can just like do it as simply. But the basic idea is that, hey, we have this rule, so we could also use it for much elements. So now we get to this, what, what should we do? So we should sample from the posterior of the mean of each other. So we should sample from the posterior of the predicted amount of conversions per spend for each campaign. And based on that, we can do the sample or the allocation. So then we get to this, like, how to model the results or purchases per spend that you get per campaign. So I, as I said, so in advertisement that I like funnel or the data process cost, so you see an ad or you actually spend money first to get an impression of that. And then people click, they do conversions, you get revenue in lifetime. The issue with this type of funnel is that it's very common that you have a 10 million audience, maybe 100,000 or 1 million see your ad out of those 10,000 click that maybe uh, 1,000 view some products 100 do some add to cards then do a purchase so you get only 10 purchases maybe a day, maybe a week so the amount of purchases starts to be quite low and when you, when you go from that purchase towards revenue so from those 10 people, maybe <coughs> 9 bought with 10 euros, 1 bought with 1,000 euros. So there is a lot of like random variation happening to, the more you go to the right end. Left end has a lot of data, but it's far away from your like actual interest what you are doing. But you still would like to do the decisions on that low level, so react fast. So, but that's like the, so then uh, you really need to model it well, so that you are actually, un understand all the uncertainties that there are in this side. So I said, so we earlier supported optimizing towards conversions. So conversions is much easier case than the revenue. So conversions you can model it as POS or, or NetBin or some other distribution. And that's just count. So with counts it's quite much easier. So that uh, conversion model we had just like implemented ourselves directly in Python. So sampling from a lot of tricks just to like understand what is the model. So we had a very good model for estimating the cost per action, so conversion per cost. So model for that. And now we wanted to move towards optimizing the revenue per cost. So that's ROAS return on ad spend. So how we can move to that part? So we just like model it separately. So we understand that funnel how people move in the advertisement. So we think that, okay, maybe most of the ads actually, it's about just bringing the conversion and then people the amount of revenue that comes per conversion. So that's a separate thing. So we could model that per action. So the old data for modeling the amount of conversion, so that had a lot of data. It varies fast. It's maybe bigger differences. So it's also like the closer we are to the ad, the bigger impact it has. So you could think also that the revenue, we are already quite far from the advertisement that we have seen. We are interested in actually like knowing how much the advertisement affects the revenue. So if you look at revenue per conversion, so maybe the advertisement didn't have any effect on that. It was more like that you just ended up doing a purchase. And then after what came as revenue, it's just like, okay, the advertisement itself didn't have an impact. But there are, of course, campaigns. Maybe you are showing something so where there is a true impact. But we should basically be able to take those away so that the user don't, doesn't have to do it. Because what we see is that people overreact to things and our purpose is to take that kind of overreaction away. And it varies maybe much slow, slowly. So a little amount of data varying slowly, but still most, there are a lot of like raw differences, which most of are just like random, we should model that away and get it working. So we have that, uh, this new model now which we are going to implement in standard basically. So this is the part we do in standard and everything else is old. So we can plug in this and get it working. So then like how do we model the revenue per conversion or per purchase? So 
So this is the whole idea. Here we can use hierarchical models. So the idea is that there are some little amount of conversions per single campaign, or single ad. And okay, if there is this 1,000 purchase or 10 euros purchase, so it might have happened in some other ads. So we can use this kind of hierarchy. So there is the whole advertisement about your campaign and then single ad. So maybe the single ad is similar to the other ads in the same campaign if they don't uh, differ. So that's like that. By default, we assume that they are similar. So then, of course, revenue it can flow any type of distribution. Log normal works for us already pretty well. So that that's like a realistic case. So there is a lot of variation. So use that. And one complication for us, there are many related to advertisement, but one is that we don't observe individual purchases. So we just see aggregated data. So we now we have hourly aggregate. So we see how many people did the purchases during one hour and what was the total revenue. And okay, that brings quite a lot of complexity. So we cannot follow directly as log normal. So we use kind of approximation. So we have one, we have model for single revenue per conversion, and then we can turn that model into like the, what is the sum of those events. So it's another log normal with transform parameters, basically. But that already gives the reason why we need more of standard. Why can't we use ready-made models for log normal or something else here? Because our target parameter, it's not like direct log normal. So we have a transform target parameter that we need to tune a bit more. Then we have a hierarchical model. We have a lot of things going on that we want to do. So we need a custom thing. Of course, we could build something in Python as we have done for other parts, but this starts to be already an area where it's like nice to be able to just write your model, which is quite simple, but then if you wouldn't implement everything, so it gets quite nasty. So Stan was always on the list that I would like to do it in Stan and then find a use case. So this was very good narrow use case that Stan fits very well how to do it. So then we get how to solve this kind of issue with Stan like more kind of uh, how did we do it. So we, of course, you start with something simple. So you start without those hierarchies. So there is this uh, hierarchy. So just fill in the how many observations there are. And you do something very simple. You trust the standard work, which usually doesn't do in, in, in the first place. So we have this uh, like observation that there is this like long part in the code which is about that transformation that I mentioned that we need to do. So that, that takes into that account. So we basically per uh, ad set, that's the term that we are you know, trying to estimate. For that we are trying to estimate the average revenue per conversion distribution. So then when you do that kind of model, so when we want to run it in production, so we have like a thousand customers, they run a lot of campaigns and they would like this to work for all of those campaigns. Some of those customers, they get just few conversions, some get a lot of, some have very different revenue distribution. So we would like this model to work for all of them automatically. So how to get that kind of working is, of course, you take some data set first that you start, just start feeding the model manually, then you get it, your model working with that first. Then you take a bit more data set so that you can look. So what I found very useful was that I actually produced like uh, PDF plots automatically about like 100 different cases. So that I can actually see different real cases, run the model through all of those cases and find out differences. So like this kind of that, hey, my model didn't actually fit in this case. And initially, of course, there are a lot of errors that I'm totally out of the scale. Maybe something else. So then you start to fix those and identify. Then soon you get to the stage that there is maybe only like a few percent of your cases don't fit. I don't like that. Then you can look those, but you could maybe do some automatic checks or numeric calculation to identify those, but I found it very easy. Like visually, even though you have 100 pages, you just click them through and I is very fast catching those in the developing mode. So, and the basic goal was that you should get your model work with all of the data sets that you have, which are very different, and get the posterior estimates. Of course, you do a lot of other types of checking, but that was a good overall, so that you actually work on realistic data sets that are very different, and you get your model work. So, then you get, end up with a bit more 
uh, complicated model where we have implemented the theoretical, theoretical model and uh, some kind of parameters. So what we do, we actually learn how to get your model working. So stand in theory is very nice way to write your Bayesian models and do inference. But in practice it's often very hard to get it stable, stable running in production. So even today in the morning session to so that you get a lot of warnings or something that something doesn't fit. So and if you want to run that automatically so you are <coughs> almost guaranteed to like face some issues when you run it. So I, I would even say that okay you, you can see that Stan is uh, designed from more the researcher perspective it's going towards the productization. So there are maybe languages that uh, come from different angles or more from the like developer side and improving on the coding like this PyMC3 or TensorFlow probability. They at the time of them when we started they didn't have all the functionalities and the server uh, which one fits your case better. Stan fits our case very well now but it's also could develop the other alternatives. But with Stan, I would say that it's very good to limit the scope of the model. If you want to run it in production, so have a very specific use case that you, you, are, you can make sure that it works and it's then scales to all different data sets you have. And how to get it working is to like all those kind of tricks that you have learned. So reparameterize, so maybe uh, that the distributions are not like they are like zero one normal distribution that you scan, or something like that. Use very reasonable informative priors that was discussed over in the morning. So you should actually give the priors that we know. We know, for example, that revenue is a monetary unit, so we know more or less the scale of like what a single act can cost. So you should bring those information there, uh, because especially these cases where there isn't much data. So we, the model should fit also in those cases and give reasonable results. And we, for example, from our use case, it makes sense that if there is not data, we want that they are like campaigns to actually give the same revenue per conversion. So we want to be conservative. So then we can bring that into the drivers as well, so that if not enough data, be conservative. And that helps all the uh, converters. And also, actually, custom initialization was something that we found out that especially in those cases where there are not much data, so sometimes the random initialization fails to convert, so it was actually easy, easy to do a bit more initialization, which is more narrow, so more closer to parts, not so wide, so then don't sometimes it uh, like end up out of their possible range. So, then, uh, okay, the sampling is the default, so. Uh, then has this HMC, which is very nice sampling and of course produces the good results, but it's some cases too slow. So for example, when, when we have cases where we have just like few ads, then it, the sampling would work, but then if you have like 10,000 ads and you want to run it daily and get it like out, then you have a thousand other cases, so then it just cannot wait for one day because you wanted to get the results in a few minutes. So then there are other alternatives. So uh, there is this kind of variational inference that basically approximates your posterior distribution with some other uh, distribution. So that actually the reason why we took standing use was at that this Atwick came out was released one half years ago. So I think we, that was the reason why we started because now we could get be able to run something in production fast enough. But the issues is this kind of approximation that they don't always work. So. When you run this approximation, it goes much faster, but you should, of course, validate that you get the same result than what, what is the sampling given. So you could say that sampling is the like, truth that you should trust, and you should just validate that the uh, ADV rational inference gives the same results. There is this uh, maximum a posteriori, like very good point estimates, but they are not, in our case, useful enough because we need the, like, real uncertainties and be able to sample. There were also some issues with this ADVI, so then like what we found out that when you run in production daily, so sometimes those they know, like there is like fine tuning of the parameters in the beginning, sometimes that fails for us, maybe to the initialization the license, then we just find out that there is some, some parameters that are just easier to fix and not, not let the ADVI to find them again. So 
you could say that uh, now what we do, we have about like 1,000 euros, maybe 10,000. That not, I'm not sure actually. I haven't checked, but like the scale, like through this budget allocation, about 1 million euros daily is spent, so that some money goes via this kind of allocation. Not all cases are using this revenue optimization, but something is used. So it's quite a mass massive scale already. So how we do it is we use Python actually interface. So there is a lot of uh, surrounding Python code to wrap that so that we are safe also data handling on processing. We use for scheduling, we use Celery. We have a lot of monitoring going around. If something would fail, we would just revert to conversion optimization so we would skip the revenue. But so far, actually, I'm quite surprised. So it's been running smoothly over a year. We haven't done much modifications for that. So the other parts we have been like considering implementing optimization somewhere else, but it's been running smoothly. So you could say that you can get the stand working in production, but then it's just limit the scope, may test very well, bring a lot of automation and validate that event. So just to give you an idea of how, what, what are the like results from this kind of model. So now this is just for the revenue per conversion. So of course the revenue per spend differs, but so there is the, like the campaigns differ in the amount of purchases that they bring per spend, but then if you look at the revenue per purchase, so that's now what we are interested in this model. So very common case is that your campaigns or ads don't differ in the revenue purpose because that's so far from your advertisement. So and that's what we wanted to get rid of so that people don't overreact to the random numbers that they see. So some kind of plot. So. There are those like raw numbers and matched numbers, so we get that every campaign has similar performance. Then there are some cases that your campaigns differ, the ads inside that campaign don't differ. So maybe you have a, like, so where the hierarchy brings information. And then there are like cases where there's a lot of data and the actual differences in your campaign. So then we can identify that and use the results. Okay, that's actually my part. So. Thank you very much. And if you are interested, so we are currently also looking one senior data scientist who would know a lot of PSM modeling and so on, mainly in Helsinki, but we have a lot of opportunities elsewhere as well. So thank you. Hi, my name is Anna. I'm from Lendable, and I'm very excited to be here today and to tell you a little bit of what we do, how we do use. Bayesian models and Stan in particular um, to kind of in our daily life. Um, so a quick overview of what I'm going to talk in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to give a quick introduction about what we do and kind of what our problem is and how we solve that and how we use Stan. Um, so Lendable is a startup. Um, we are an upfront debt capital for alternative lenders platform what the, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so we are the link between investors in the US and Europe and so-called alternative lenders in East Africa. Alternative lenders um, are non-deposit taking asset-backed um, finance institutes or credit institutes. Um, so for example, we have customers that lease motorbikes for taxi drivers, or I think we looked into some, uh, uh, some business that lent cows for um, like agriculture purposes, or solar panels to get people access to electricity. Um, so this is kind of a part of the impact investing movement. Um, and what we do is basically we uh, look into a customer and then purchase part of their portfolio, which gives them capital to grow, um, and we, uh, we purchase the right to receive the repayments of loans on motorbikes, for example. Um, it's called receivable, uh, receivable financing. Um, another part is that we do some data analysis um, and build analysis tools for our customers to help them maintain their portfolio and also for ourselves to kind of keep track of everything. Um, so our problem, so to say, is um, that we want to predict those repayments. We want to predict cash flows. Um, there, are, there are problems that come with that. Um, let, me, let me quickly, oopsie. 
let's go back. Um, we've seen um, that um, we, we, we want to perform our models on a loan level, so each individual loan gets its own kind of tracking uh, line. And we want to really be very careful about co-movements. We've seen that before, that um, individual loans, especially when they're defaulting, if the economy is kind of bad, um, there is some correlation. And we want to be really careful about that because it can mess up a lot. And um, then we have the problem that we have time series. And if you want to predict more than one further step in time, um, your predictions become your predictors. Um, so the model of cross-validating that is, um, has to be kind of overcome. Um, to quickly give your heads up, those are the reasons why we use Dan and Bayesian model in particular. Um, it allows us to model efficiently um, unusual likelihoods. And um, the, the second part is kind of how we pitch that investors. Um, Bayesian modeling allows us to incorporate um, things, uncertainty, that we cannot see in the data. Um, so to give you a quick overview about, about what I'm talking about. Um, when modeling um, cash flows, when modeling repayments on the, on the, lo repayments on the loan level, um, there are, there are certain things that you have to consider. So um, there are an economic shocks um, that you want to incorporate into your model. Um, you want to be very careful about correlation, um, which we have seen across our, our customers based to the similarity of their collections efforts, for example. And an, another big part is um, that we cannot really observe heavy shocks or the scale of the shocks in the data because usually when some things like that happen you don't have any data anymore yeah and um so bayesian modeling um allows us um or san allows us to do that efficiently to kind of model this co-movement which allows um certain parts of the portfolio to kind of move away from like the, the median case or something uh, and parts that kind of stick to it. Um, and this, is, this can be rather tricky and, and hard and complicated to do with so-called classical um, methodologies and techniques. Um, so what, we, what, what do we need? In, like, at the end of the day, we need to um, kind of well, uh, calibra to kind of calibrate well uncertainty <coughs> into our model. Um, and we, uh, <coughs> like, the, the most important thing, or the most the kind of main problem, is that we need predictions how how much is going to be paid back at a certain different point in time, big T, for example, which might be 60 months from now, which is kind of a very long time. Um, to show you a little bit of what I'm talking about, this is um, a monthly plot of uh, some scaled version of uh, how much is going to be repaid over time, and um, so each line is, is like a cohort of, of loans that originated, for example, in the same month um, or something else. Um, and we see some correlation there. Um, for example, what we've seen, especially in, in Kenya, for example, is that uh, at the end or at the beginning of a school year where school fees are due, repayments drop. Those things, for example. Um, so there is a, there's a time component that you want to incorporate into your model or that we want to incorporate. Um, and the other thing is that um, kind of the likelihood or the, the density of what we try to model at the end of the day is far away from being normal. Um, and so what, what you can see here is um, um, the density of kind of um, the proportion of um, what was actually paid versus what was due. Um, so some of our lenders, they have like a weekly or a monthly schedule. For example, this is a weekly schedule and you can see the weeks here. So the, the due payment is what was due um, in a week and then it's like uh, half of it or like a proportion of it. And uh, on the left hand side, you see those who just didn't pay. Um, so the likelihood that we 
that we end up with basically is a, um, a combination of discrete and continuous. Um, so it's kind of not, not normal. Um, and Stan comes in here very, very handy. Um, I, I cannot, or at least I don't know um, about any other um, methodology or kind of um, software that does that in a very efficient way. Um, the other thing that I quickly talked about, mentioned in the beginning is that when you um, predict time series outcomes over multiple time <laughs> slots in the future, your predictions become uh, predictors. So you have to be really, really careful about backtesting back those models. Um, and um, if you want to, to um, kind of do that, um, it becomes computationally very, very expensive. Um, and we use um, a combination of R and Stan and Python to kind of do that. And the, the handy thing here is that we can incorporate Stan functions into our R um, scripts and just kind of tell R, please do simulate. And without our developers to need to learn C++, um, but we can kind of expose Stan functions into R and efficiently simulate um, our models. And this kind of brought us to a, an enormous speed up compared to R and Python. Um, um, especially because this, this uh, functions are easily parallelizable. Um, so for example, with, with eight cores, we had a 4K speed up in running simulations with, by exposing stand functions into R and kind of just let it do, kind of simulate, um, which comes in very, very, very handy, at least, at least for us. Um, and now I'm gonna kind of quickly talk about how we actually do all that kind of stuff, right? So we have one baseline model, um, it's the model template, um, which is basically a zip file. It contains the Stan script that runs the model. It contains some R scripts to prepare the data. There are some alteration to some customers. Not every customer is, is, is the same. Um, so those R scripts ha sometimes have to be updated, but usually the model template kind of basically stays the same. Oh, and it also has um, um, functions to, to simulate the model. Um, each model template is the basis of a model estimation. So for each of our lenders, we can estimate this repayments, this cash flow and defaults model. Um, and based on this, on this model estimation, we run back tests. So we are back testing every single model estimation to be kind of sure that we're doing the right thing. And I, I will quickly talk about that as well and show you some pictures. Um, if we say, okay, the back test looks good, looks good, we also look at some kind of evaluation metrics. Um, we kind of approve the model estimation and can run simulations. So um, we've um, built an R library that allows us to expose stand functions into R and kind of simulate a model efficiently. Um, we can also do a bunch of um, automated uh, visualizations that allow to kind of quickly see is it doing the right thing um, and do back testing in a, in a proper way. Um, and if we say, okay, the model looks good, the simulations are looking good, there is no further need for all. Sometimes we have to make some alterations when something is severely different from what we are used to, which is not often the case. Um, and if we if we are done with that, um, we can run portfolio simulations. So um, as I told you before, we are not buying the, like an entire customer and entire lender. We are uh, purchasing um, a part of their portfolio. So we can run portfolio simulations, and we have some criteria um, for loans in this in kind of our and the lendable portfolio to be met and kind of to be to be part of that. Um, and so once we have the model uh, estimation and simulation, we can run the portfolio simulation only on those loans that we uh, find um, fitting for our criteria. Um, and after we've done all that, we have kind of the final output is um, kind of, we can aggregate that up for the portfolio to see what can we expect 
in a median case, in an upper case, and a lower case of cash flows and repayments to come back. And then we can put that in front of the business team and the investment team, and they can say, uh, then they say, okay, let's price it like A, B, C, um, and kind of to secure, kind of to kind of close this whole process. Um, yeah, and um, to, this is my favorite slide. Um, so we have here an, 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 a similar, um, uh, very fancy or unusual likelihood. Um, and the uh, orange lines are the posterior application. So those are our backtesting simulation, kind of automated pictures that we, that we uh, visualizations that we, um, that we get from our backtesting. Um, and this is one of, the, one of the visualizations that we use to um, evaluate if we're on the right track and, or, if we, or if the model is not fitting or if the model is not a good fit at all for our purpose. Um, so um, to kind of sum it all up, my favorite slide again. Um, so Stan allows us to efficiently and very carefully model unusual likelihoods. We got a huge speed up compared to R or, or Python. And uh, in general, Bayesian modeling is um, kind of allows us to incorporate and like those shocks I, talk, I talked about before that we cannot really see in the data, but we know like in the back of our heads that might have an issue and there is some uncertainty that we want to incorporate, right? Um, um, and yeah, so that's, that's the most helpful thing. And I, that's uh, actually something that I, I came across uh, a lot lately. When you talk to, especially in general, non, non let's say tech people or non statistic people, um, convincing someone that especially this kind of modeling is the right way to do or that this is how it should be done in our, in our opinion um, this is the this is the main argument that gets gets people if someone is like very very stubborn um, about how modeling is done or how the world should work you can you, you cannot sell anything or any model you cannot explain anything if another person is that stubborn uh, but in in, uh, in general, if um, your, your, the person you talk to understands um, some part of modeling or kind of s some part of information and how data comes together, their, their argument um, that you can incorporate information that you might have into your model, into your beliefs um, and what you do at the end of the day without kind of having to without knowing if it is in the data or not, or with knowing it not, is not in the data, this is the kind of go-to argument that we've seen works the best when convincing that the Bayesian modeling should be everywhere. Um, yeah, and that's it for me. Thank you very much. So the, the only person who didn't do a presentation is Tom, so I thought I could maybe ask you to tell us a bit about uh, what you do um, and how do you how do you guys understand uh, in, um, in your environment? Yeah, thanks. Can you hear me? Um, so I'm Tom Wilson, I'm a data scientist for Tui, uh, Tui.io, which is a uh, software development R&D lab. Um, we have a number of clients across um, biocomputing, pharmaceuticals, um, blockchain stuff going on. Um, and one of the projects I'm working a lot on is a um, fintech company providing digital financial advice. Um, I'm using Stan in, in all sorts of projects from um, projects where you have to run stand very quickly in small <coughs> projects to where uh, you're just running stand whenever you feel like it once a week maybe a larger model. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been great for estimating time series um, and models of um, pharmaceutical uh, problems. Thanks. So maybe I'll, I'll ask um, um, Marcus, uh, what what were some of the original 
uh, impediments, I guess, to adoption? Like, how, how did you guys, when you started implementing uh, uh, Stan and you, you thought about, you know, productizing this workflow, what were some of the initial uh, pains and, and, and uh, how did you overcome this? Yeah, so I, I think we wanted to use them even before there was this variational inference of when the sampling existed. So then one of the biggest pain was already that it was just too slow for our scale to use. So when the ADVI came, so we were very happy that, hey, now we could actually be able to run something in production scale that our data fast enough. But still, like, the pain was just like getting it actually working with all different types of data. So I think that project when, okay, from when we started, it took maybe four months from like the beginning to actually have everything running in production smoothly. Of course, maybe the intense modeling part was maybe one, one month doing, doing those and testing. So, but it's, it was, you no, know, I, I had used them before, but still like getting it work everything your surrounding. So there was just like, instead one, one line and one parameter can have a huge impact. So it's quite fine tuning to get everything working smoothly. Right. So I'll ask Anna, so you, uh, as far as I understand, uh, uh, came to Lendable when some of this infrastructure was already in place. I think. <laughs> yeah. um, and so you had to uh, sort of learn to work inside of the existing mm -hmm. environment. So what, what are some of the challenges for you uh, starting to work in, in the environment that, that uses Stan and... and, and um, um, well, first of all, to kind of collect all the information that you need to kind of get to know a system is, can be sometimes tough because like this person is a special knowledge in this environment and that environment at the most tricky part for me was to understand the connection between Stan and R and kind of how I can personally leverage that. Um, as well as um, most, like the, the whole web application where we run the models and the simulations um, is hosted um, mostly in Python. Um, I have very little knowledge about Python and kind of those kind of, the, the connection points are the, the most difficult points um, to kind of Stan and R that is kind of the same at some point when, you, when you're when trying to understand it. But how R and Python communicate is sometimes very, very odd and very tricky to, go, to see through basically and kind of, um, but that comes with time and that, um, I, re I really enjoyed kind of learning this very, very well thought of structure and it kind of has grown over time um, to kind of get that knowledge about Edge, edge cases and use cases where, for example, my, my, my boss Jim already knows this won't work and can tell me kind of don't do that. Um, so this, is, this was really helpful. Um, but yeah, so that's, okay. that's the main points. Um, another thing um, I, I wonder, uh, maybe t uh, Tom, you can comment on it or if anyone else uh, wants to is, uh, um, to, to work inside of this environment, inside of Stan and, and other probabilistic languages, it's uh, um, you know, not, not a lot of people have this, these skills, right? Um, and so oftentimes, um, you know, when, when recruiting, you have to find uh, some, some approximation uh, to uh, a person who has all these skills is likely you probably won't find exactly that. Um, if you, you had some experience with that, how, how do you go about, um, you know, finding the people? What, what's the ideal background? Well, I had a great guy working for me who uh, had a background in theoretical um, physics um, and actually understood quite a lot of the uh, Hamiltonian uh, simulation. Um, but he, he just understood it as uh, simulating the trajectory of Hamiltonian mechanics. And, and, and Although some of the vocabulary clashes, um, I think that made it really easy to transition um, and, and start with Bayesian, even though he didn't know statistics, but starting with, with Bayesian inference um, and actually pick it up really quickly. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that is a great background. Um, if you don't have a background in statistics, uh, then um, that's the kind of theoretical physics. I think scientists in general make really good data scientists. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely something I'd look at recruiting again. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, I, well, I can kind of agree on that. So, like, you need to know that have have math background, whether it's the theoretical physics or something else. So that that gives gives you the solid understanding. Of course, it's preferable that you have been doing some Bayesian stuff. For us, because we are like a web development company, we are actually or we were looking more like unicorns who know both software development and like Bayesian analytics very well. So. There are rare people who know both sides very well. So now, now we have our because company has grown, so we can just look people who know more about the Bayesian model and are willing to learn also the development and are interested in solving the customer problems. So, mm -hmm. cool. yeah, but still from the same kind of background, I think is ideal. Yeah. Any any thoughts on that? Well, I I started mathematics, um, and kind of the first thing that we were kind of taught basically is or told in the first couple of months, is that you're, you're not learning like a specific, sorry, and, and you're not really learning or being taught a specific formula or this is how kind of it works or something like that. When you're studying um, mathematics or physics or something <coughs> like any, any more science um, field, you're being taught a way of um, thinking, a way of problem solving, how to tackle things and kind of how to structure um, problem solving in the end, and I think um, that really helps both with statistics, the Bayesian workflow, and computer stuff in general. Okay. Anybody tried converting a frequentist into the into the Bayesian? Uh... <laughs> I, I've succeeded with my myself. Oh, you did. Yeah, the, so that's like I did my PhD on frequentist topics. So, but that's luckily eight years ago. Oh, so then you realized that what did I do? Congratulations! <laughs> yeah, but that, like, life has changed. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let me turn it. We we have a few more minutes. Uh, maybe we can turn it uh, over to the audience and ask if anybody has a question. Oh, let's, let's take one from the front. Hi, uh, this is Demarcus. So yeah. You guys said you were fitting, you know, thousands of models a day with the PDI. Um, do you have any sort of automated diagnosis or checking of model sanity that you do for that? Uh, yeah, we have some very simple that like basically the outcomes of the model give, give good results. And we, of course, there is this like that we gave so really like that it has converged or so, so, so we run those. We have some kind of uh, rerun that if something fails, so then we rerun it automatically again. But it, mainly it's been that when we have been just running it, in many cases it has worked and we have fine tuned. And of course we have logging in place, so we have been looking that if something has failed, so then analyzing why that case failed. So we basically log, log all of the input and output data that we get, so then all, all of the like, logs from the advice so that we could go looking for specific cases. But surprisingly for one year we haven't had to, that specific revenue Stand part we haven't had to look, so it's been working since quite well. Of course, initially we, there were a lot of those min, minor things that we need, needed to fix. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, Eric. Yeah, so for myself it was basically, uh, okay, to, from tool perspective, it's just like instead of saying sampling, you say that you use uh, VI. So that, that, that's like from tool perspective, it's very easy for, like why we did was basically that the sampling was too slow for those big data sets that we have, that it wouldn't converge in the time that we basically, because we want to do decisions every day and get the budget changes. Actually, you need to, do, should do those during midnight, so there is not much time and we want to use the recent data. So that was just like constraints that we need fast algorithms to do it. We could, of course, implement stuff ourselves and uh, do that kind of variational approximation, but because there just came this nice advi, so why not give it a try? So it, it wasn't I like our company is something that I just want to do it, so then you just do it and there, you don't need to convince anybody else than yourself and see that the data gives that it works basically. Okay. Uh, Angie, go ahead. Um, I have a question related to the product and Industry to industry. So I was just curious, have there been any global attempts to apply 
SCM, you mean uh, supply chain management? Is it, yeah, and logistics industry. Anybody has a comment? No, I think it sounds like a great idea. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, no experience at least. Mm -hmm. I we we were contacted a few years back by uh, I think by a logistics company to do some work. We uh, um, we didn't end up doing it. Uh, I think that people are trying, uh, but perhaps uh, this panel is not the best to answer that because <laughs> we work in pharma. These guys do finance and uh, ad, ad marketing. So yeah. Okay. yeah, in the back. Yeah, that would be very good. So for, of course, like if you look how to make it fast, so the stand model needs to be pre-compiled. So we have like GitHub integration and deployment. So whenever we push something new in the deployment, so then we pre-compile the stand model at that time. So we have a compiled model in the server, which then runs the like the actual sampling. So, but, but we don't surprisingly use historical, like the previous model fits. So we just like, uh, take the recent data. Now we are maybe taking the last 14 days and use something there and just fit, fit the data with that. So from scratch every day from ev for every account, basically. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah, this is maybe a question for all of you because uh, you work, uh, maybe some of you want to answer it, but uh, you work uh, to a different degree, I guess, with kind of a basic model that you maybe adjust per customer. I was wondering if to what degree you're doing this and to what degree you're involving the customer in in like, you know, adjusting the priors maybe or adjusting the model itself um, for, for each customer separately. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll answer for us because I think, so, so we, I think we do that maybe more than uh, people who work with uh, very specific use case. Uh, of course, we try to get a model that fits everybody, but for for us, it's very very hard, right? So the uh, in uh, pharma in in clinical research, you know, there there are uh, so far we've always had to you know incorporate some uh, some additional information uh, into into a model, particularly because when we work in, in a specific disease area. Um, there, a pathway of one disease may be different than, than another. And, um, you know, f for us, uh, we, we, we spent some time with uh, uh, either biologists or clinical researchers to gather this information uh, pretty early on, right? And, and so sometimes we have to um, read literature uh, on, the, on the subject to get some reasonable priors. Uh, uh, often we have to to elicit that information directly from people who have done this trial in the past, um, and so it's k kind of an iterative process. But in, in general, the structurally, like our models are similar, right? So if we if we are, you know, doing stuff in um, in like phase one research, you know, the observation is is usually the same, right? It's uh, we measuring concentration of compound in blood over time. Um, in later stage, you know, the structure is maybe also similar where we have now some survival data, some hazard data, but then we have some biomarker um, data. And so um, structurally they're, they're similar, but uh, in terms of the mechanistic or semi-mechanistic part uh, is often need to be tweaked. Yeah. I don't know if you want to comment on it. Yeah, for, for us, it's it's a little bit different. So our baseline model stays more or less the same. Um, we have a, an awesome data team uh, that uh, talks to our customers, that kind of works, they sit together kind of side by side and kind of tweak the data until it fits our format. And this is what I'm really, really glad and really appreciative about it. I get kind of the clean data in the format that I'm used to. Um, so what sometimes what needs to be done is that um, 
um, some some variables, for example, mean different things to different customers. So we just have to to tweak that a little bit. But that is usually done when preparing the data for the model estimation. The baseline model stays more or less the same. Um, where we close, where, where we work more closely with our customers, if as uh, if they ask for a specific analytic analytical tools for their portfolio management. Um, there we really also sit together in, in uh, multiple sessions to kind of work that out and kind of include their knowledge into kind of our framework and to kind of have this back and forth. Um, but that is not the usual case for us. Yeah. I would also comment. So we actually we do productized analytics. So basically we, have, we try to build just one model that works for all. And that's the basically very challenging because we have very different types of vertical, different types of customers. So how you can build something that works in all cases automatically. But we still work very closely with the most advanced customers actually to get the feedback. So you could also say that the, okay, we have this revenue optimization in place, but it's somewhat wrong. It doesn't work for all of the customers uh, correctly. So we, for example, I, we have no one case where it doesn't work. So well, currently we estimate that revenue is positive which like, <laughs> sounds like a natural assumption to start. But then some customers come to us, hey, people, uh, if you are e-commerce, people return stuff back to the e-com, and that actually generates negative revenue. So we currently, we just exclude that data, but we should improve the model. That, of course, if we improve the, that in the model, it will help also other customers who have faced the same issue. And that's the goal. Whatever we do, we want that it would solve the issue for all of the customers. But we, at the moment, we don't do customer-specific models. Let me just comment that uh, in finance, there's something called the black model, where you ask the uh, customer to give the uh, expectations of the growth in different stocks and uh, then you can sort of do a trade-off between what you think and the customer thinks. So it's not exactly a product, but it sort of works a little bit like that and that, that's a theory that's been developed for some years. We, we, we have time for one more short question. Anybody wants to? Go ahead. Uh, I don't know if anyone has had trouble with updating their models. Uh, so like right now, which seems a bit wasteful given that like, the final answers should be very, very close to the answers they had yesterday for, for the first thousand people. And I haven't really found a good answer or a good way to deal with that, so I'm just wondering. If you do find a good answer, please tell us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's it's something that like Bayesian inference should is is clearly lends itself to that kind of analysis, right? Um, and so we, in principle, if you can capture a posterior distribution in some kind of parametric form, you should then use you should be able to use it uh, for the update. We we haven't done it, um, and I think you said uh, Jonah is mentioning that they're working on some tools to make it easier. Yeah. Anyone else has a comment? Yeah, if, if I can start, if you're happy with a, the plus approximation, but with a, with a covariant matrix, um, then if you can run BFGS, then that you can catch the, uh, the estimate, estimate, the quasi using estimate, and then you can use that as a starting point for the adaptation parameter of the BFGS uh, on, on the next, and then when you add more data. And, uh, and that can work really, really well. So, so you can get a linear, as you add one more data point, then you just get a linear. Uh, or in fact, even sometimes your inference time can go down because you start making better and better studies. Approximation, so you should be able to update one 
All right, that's all we have. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for coming. Appreciate it.